Hi guys. It is starting to feel like the fall of 2021 finally here and the collapse of global industrial civilization. At least up here in the Finger Lakes of New York. Uh, I guess the high is 48 degrees tomorrow. So anyway, uh, I need to get out and plant about 50 daffodil bulbs to already be thinking about the spring of 2022. But before I do that, since it is Sunday, it is Sunday, October 17th, 2021. It is time to bring you the weekly doomsday sermon where uh, I look through the mainstream media in various places and uh, to bring you this week's sermon. Now, several of you have sent me this long, excellent article from The Guardian, came out a few days ago, <clears throat> called The Climate Disaster Is Here, Earth Is Already un Becoming Unlivable. Will governments act to stop this disaster from getting worse? Well, obviously, we all know the answer to that question. Will governments act to stop this disaster from getting worse? No, everything that's going to happen uh, will make it sure that it's going to get worse till we're all gone. Uh, but anyway, guys, once again, this is not a sermon. This is a news story. I will try to remember to put the link <coughs> to it. But for an actual sermon... As part of the answer to the question, will governments act to stop this disaster from getting worse, we're going to hear from a fellow whose name I vaguely recognize, Jeremy Lent. And I am so sorry, I cannot remember the alert listener who sent this to me. But who is Jeremy Lent? Just so you know who the preacher of the day is. <clears throat> Jeremy Lent is an author and speaker whose work investigates the underlying causes of our civilization's existential crisis <clears throat> and explores pathways toward a life-affirming future. Yeah, so obviously <clears throat> Jeremy uh, does have a little bit of hopium, which of course shines through in this long, uh, excellent essay with a hopium Hollywood future titled Solving the Climate Crisis. Uh, I'm sorry, this is from Salon Magazine. <clears throat> Salon Magazine. Uh, from their commentary page. Solving the climate crisis requires the end of capitalism. Overcoming the climate crisis will require a shift away from our growth-based, corporate-dominated global system. Okay, Jeremy Lant, the pulpit is yours. <clears throat> The global conversation, again, I'm, I'm probably going to read about half of this, guys. This is a long, involved story, so you can finish it up yourself. <clears throat> the global conversation regarding climate change has, for the most part, ignored the elephant in the room. That is strange, because this particular elephant is so large, obvious, and all-encompassing that politicians and executives must contort themselves to avoid naming it publicly. That elephant is called overpopulation. <laughs> I'm just kidding, folks. I am just kidding. Clearly, not even uh, this dude, not even this doomer, anywhere in this article will you see the elephant in the room, which is overpopulation. Okay? <clears throat> but anyway, this is not Sam Mitchell's sermon. This is Jeremy's sermon. So uh, I guess we're going to call this the hippopotamus in the room. All right? The elephant in the room, brother, is overpopulation. 
So the hippopotamus in the room is called capitalism, and it is high time to face the fact that as long as capitalism remains the dominant economic system of our globalized world, the climate crisis will not be resolved. And of course, we could stop right here because everybody, including this dude, knows damn well that capitalism is going to remain the dominant economic system of our globalized world until we have no planet. But anyway, again, uh, for those of uh, you claiming, clinging to some delusion that we are ever going to overthrow global capitalism any more than we are going to sterilize the human race, I really will try to shut up now and let Jeremy Lent uh, try to convince us of the need to overthrow global capitalism. <clears throat> All right. As the crucial, the crucial UN climate talks known as COP26 approach in early November, the public has grown increasingly aware that the stakes have never been higher. What were once ominous warnings of future climate shocks wrought by wildfires, floods, and droughts have now become a staple of the daily news, yet governments are failing to meet their own emissions pledges from the Paris Agreement six years ago, which were themselves acknowledged to be inadequate. Increasingly, respected earth scientists are, are warning not just about the devastating effects of climate breakdown on our daily lives, but about the potential collapse of civilization itself unless we drastically change direction. So, of course, Jeremy is a defender of civilization. So uh, I, I know that rules out some of the people listening to this. So this is if you think <clears throat> it is a good idea to save global civilization, uh, then let's hear what Jeremy has to say. And yet, even as humanity faces perhaps the greatest existential crisis in our species history, the public debate on climate barely mentions the underlying economic system that brought us to this point and which continues to drive us toward the precipice. Ever since its emergence in the 17th century with the creation of the first limited liability shareholder-owned corporations, capitalism has been premised on viewing the planet as a resource to exploit. Its overriding objective to maximize profits from that exploitation as rapidly and extensively as possible. Current mainstream strategies to resolve our own twin crises of climate breakdown and ecological overshoot without changing the underlying system of growth-based global capitalism are structurally inadequate. And uh, next to that, we have an ad from Citibank. Uh, earn up to $1,500 rewards from Citibank. Then we have a new sports cable channel. Then we have uh, next to that an ad about some new kind of liquor. Don't forget the ad about bong good shoes. Anyway, uh, back to uh, if you can if you can zero in from around all of the ads about this uh, article how we have to you know destroy everybody 
in the ad, starting with Citibank, would be a damn good place to start the program of ending capitalism. But anyway, let's get back to, uh, to Jeremy <clears throat> and his ideas on the Green New Deal. The idea of green growth, and that's his quotation marks, the idea of green growth is promulgated by many development consultants <clears throat> and, e and is even incorporated in the UN's official plan for, quote, sustainable development. But it has been shown to be an illusion. And uh, he, uh, there's a bunch of links to all these other articles and studies uh, in the, if you go on this link, you can follow his other links to back up his statement that the Green New Deal has been shown to be an illusion. <clears throat> Eco-modernist, I need to do a rant on eco-modernist and others who stand to profit from growth in the short term frequently make the argument that through technological innovation, <clears throat> aggregate global economic output can become, quote, absolutely decoupled mm -hmm, from resource use and carbon emissions, permitting limitless growth on a finite planet. Hmm. Careful, rigorous analysis, though, shows that this has not happened so far and even the most wildly aggressive assumptions for greater efficiency would still lead to unsustainable consumption of global resources. <clears throat> the primary reason for this, the uh, there, there's an advertisement of a dildo showing up in the middle of in the middle of this article. We we have an uh, we have an advertisement for a dildo. <laughs> right, right. I'm not making this. I, I, anyway, uh, I keep getting diverted uh, from uh, from this from all of these ads. I. I love it. Salon magazine advertising dildos in the uh, in the middle of a sermon about. Uh... <laughs> anyway, let's get back to uh, get back to the sermon here. <clears throat> the primary reason for this derives ultimately from the nature of capitalism itself. Under capitalism which has now become the default global economic context for virtually all human enterprise, efficiency improvements intended to reduce resource usage inevitably become launch pads for further exploitation, leading paradoxically to an increase rather than a decrease in consumption. And what he's talking about is Jevon's paradox uh, here. If you uh, want to look up Jevon's paradox, um, you will find out what he's talking about. That, uh... All right. Yeah, here we go. This dyna dynamic known as Jevon's paradox was first recognized back in the 19th century by economist William Stanley Jevons, who demonstrated how James Watt's steam engine, which did greatly improve the efficiency of coal-powered engines, paradoxically caused a dramatic increase in coal consumption, even while it decreased the amount of coal required for any particular application, the Jevons paradox has since been shown to be true in an endless variety of domains, from the invention in the 19th century of the cotton gin, which, 
led to an increase rather than a decrease in the practice of slavery in the American South to improved automobile fuel efficiency, which, wow, encourages people to drive longer distances. And of course, I fully admit I am one of those people. All right. Citibank is still after us to get your City Gold credit card. Should I apply now for my City Gold credit card and earn a $1,500 cash bonus? I guess I'll get over to, the, to Citibank when we finish with Jevon's Paradox. <clears throat> when the Jevon's Paradox is generalized to the global marketplace, we begin to see that it is not really a paradox at all, but rather an inbuilt defining characteristic of capitalism. Shareholder-owned corporations, such as all of these uh, advertising this article, shareholder-owned corporations as the primary agents of global capitalism are legally structured by the overarching imperative to maximize shareholder returns above everything else. Although they are given the legal rights of personhood in many jurisdictions, if they were actually humans, they would be diagnosed as psychopaths, ruthlessly pursuing their goal without regard to any collateral damage they might cause. Of the 100 largest economies today, 69 of the largest 100 economies are not countries, they are transnational corporations, which collectively represent a relentless force with one overriding objective, to turn humanity and the rest of life into fodder for endlessly increasing profit at the fastest possible rate. Under global capitalism, this dynamic holds true even without the involvement of transnational corporations. Take Bitcoin as an example. Originally designed after the global financial meltdown of 2008 to wrest money power from the domination of central banks, Bitcoin relies on building trust through mining, a process that allows anyone to verify a transaction by solving increasingly complex mathematical equations and earn new bitcoins hmm, as compensation. A great idea! In theory, in practice, the unfettered marketplace for Bitcoin mining has led to frenzied competition to solve ever more complex equations with vast warehouses holding rigs of advanced computers consuming massive amounts of electricity with the result that the carbon emissions from Bitcoin processing are now equivalent to that of a mid-sized country such as Sweden or Argentina. The relentless pursuit of profit growth above all other considerations is reflected in the world's stock markets where corporations are valued not by their benefit to society, but by investors' expo expectations of their growth in future earnings. Similarly, when aggregated to national accounts, the main proxy used to measure the performance of politicians is growth in gross domestic product usually referred to as GDP. Although it is commonly assumed that GDP correlates with social welfare, 
this is not the case once basic material requirements have been met. GDP merely measures the rate at which society transforms nature and human activity into the monetary economy, regardless of the ensuing quality of life. Anything that causes economic activity of any kind, whether good or bad, you know, for society and the planet, adds to GDP. When researchers developed a, a benchmark called the Genuine Progress Indicator, which incorporates qualitative components of well-being, they discovered a dramatic divergence between the two measures. GPI peaked in 1978 and has been steadily falling ever since, even while GDP continues to accelerate. Okay, we have a new home heating system. We have uh, Liberty Mutual Insurance taking over the dildo ad. Oh, now we have mattress firm taking over Liberty Mutual, taking over the dildos. Anyway, scrolling down past the ads. <clears throat> In spite of this, the possibility of shifting our economy away from perpetual growth is barely even considered in mainstream discourse. In preparation for COP26, the IPCC modeled five scenarios exploring potential pathways that would lead to different global heating outcomes this century, ranging from an optimistic, call that unrealistic, ridiculous, 1.5 C pathway to a likely catastrophic 4.5 C track. One of their most critical variables is the amount of carbon reduction accomplished through negative emissions relying on massive implementation of unproven technologies. According to the IPCC, according to the UN, I guess, staying under 2C of global heating consistent with the minimum target set by the 2015 Paris Agreement involves a heroic assumption that we will suck 730 billion metric tons of carbon out of the atmosphere this century. This stupendous amount is equivalent to roughly 20 times the total current annual emissions from all fossil fuel usage. Such an assumption is closer to science fiction than any rigorous analysis worthy of a model on which our civilization is basing its entire future. Yet, even as the IPCC appears willing to model humanity's fate on a pipe dream, not one, not one of their scenarios explores what is possible from a graduated annual reduction in global GDP. Such a scenario was considered by the IPCC community to be too implausible to consider, and he has a link over to that which I want to check out for the simple reason, Jeremy, it is too implausible to consider. It is not gonna happen. The IPCC knows this, I know this, Sancho Panza knows this. There is no reason to even talk about science fiction. You're talking about science fiction in one sentence, and then you come up with this absolute fantasy in the next. Ain't gonna happen. 
This represents a serious lapse on the part of the IPCC. Hmm, do you think so? Climate scientists who have modeled planned reductions in GDP show that keeping global heating below one and a half C this century is potentially within reach under this scenario with greatly reduced reliance on speculative carbon reduction technologies. I didn't realize he was uh, dipping into the hopium smoking at this point in the article. I guess he just could not keep it till the end. Uh, Okay. <clears throat> Prominent economists, some of whom I might have even entered, uh, I might have even interviewed here, these, you know, these ecological economists have shown that a carefully managed post-growth plan could lead to enhanced quality of life, reduced inequality, and a healthier environment. That would, however, undermine the foundational activity of capitalism, the pursuit of endless growth that has led to our current state of obscene inequality, impending ecological collapse, and climate breakdown. Uh, anyway, guys, uh, I'm going to have to wrap this up. Uh, we are barely one half of the way through this, uh, but we're going to have to wrap it up here, and you can just go on the link and take it to here. And uh, Okay, we're going to wrap it up with this paragraph. <clears throat> as long as this elephant, I'm sorry, as long as this hippopotamus in the room remains unspoken, our world will continue to careen toward catastrophe even as politicians and technocrats shift from one savior narrative to another. I love it. Savior narrative. Along with the myth of green growth, we are told that a solution lies in putting monetary valuations on ecosystem services and incorporating them into business decisions, even though this approach has been shown to be deeply flawed, frequently counterproductive, and ultimately self-defeating. A wetlands, for example, might have value in protecting a city from flooding. However, if it were drained and a swanky new resort built on the reclaimed land, this could be more lucrative. Case closed. Case closed. And uh, then, of course, good, he is going uh, on and on. Then, of course, he gets into uh, all of the hopium uh, I'm glad he does mention this, that he makes it clear that he is not talking about replacing capitalism with socialism. This is uh, his comment on that. Old-fashioned socialism was just as poised to consume the earth as capitalism differing primarily in how the pie should be carved up. So anybody, he wants to make clear that he is not a socialist. Anybody thinking that going from, from any ism to another ism is going to change a damn thing, at least uh, he doesn't make that part of his hopium. Uh, maybe I will uh, come back to uh, to this uh, to the hopium on Saturday. I think we'll visit the end of this article where Jeremy Lent just uh, lights up the hopium crack pipe, talking about 
how we are going to derail capitalism uh, yes, here in the next few decades and slay the hippopotamus in the room. Maybe Jeremy Lent can come back at a future date and talk about the elephant in the room, which is, of course, over population because a person who has never been born will consume exactly, exactly zero, zero of the earth's resources. A person never being born has an ecological carbon footprint of zero. Yes. And with that, I'm going to wrap this up because we've got uh, 50 King Alfred daffodil bulbs to go plant and uh, how many rhododendrons. I think we got some lilacs, some hydrangeas. Anyway, I'm going to get out there and dig in the dirt while I still can. Bye, guys. Okay, little dog, did you survive that sermon? That wasn't that bad.